Hello to my community friends. It's our podcast birthday week. The Smart Community Podcast turns three on the 23rd of February. So to celebrate, we are doing a week of bonus episodes, bringing together multiple guest answers over multiple days to the question, where to next for smart cities and communities? And in this episode, I'm sharing with you the answers from a range of our guests in this past year. Mark Thomas from episode 187, Sabrina Chikori from episode 179, Michael Holmstrom from episode 201, Imogen Schifferly from episode 189, and Deke Copenhaver from episode 186. The themes that come through in all of our guest answers are around the impacts and opportunities of COVID-19 on our cities and communities. It's shown us that we can respond and adapt really quickly when we need to, and many of the things that we used to think were reasons or barriers to implementing smart community initiatives really fell away very quickly when there was an urgent imperative to do something differently. Several guests make important points about the way the pandemic has brought to light just how important our human connections are, and that even though technology has been a crucial part of how we've all adapted and responded, it's still the humans that matter at the end of the day. As Michael Holmstrom says, ultimately, smart cities are about making places for people to live and prosper, and the pandemic has only amplified that. All guests agree that we can learn from this experience and take lessons away to make a smarter future for all of us. Listening back to these snippets, I really enjoyed when Michael talked about livable places and human connection and not going back to the way we've always done it. And Mark talked about the COVID chance, which is what he talked about in his original episode as well, rethinking city assets to solve other problems including economic development opportunities in our smart community thinking and not looking at things in silos. Deke talked about the underlying principles of smart communities and how we are bringing the community in together with us. And Dick also shares an experience of when I visited him in Augusta when he took me on a walk along the trails along the canals, which was protected green space that all the community can enjoy. Imogen brings a rural and regional perspective, talking about the ability to adapt so quickly, greener cities and adaptive cities, and purposeful interaction. And then we also talk a lot about buying back leisure time. Sabrina talks about redesigning cities around community well-being. And she says this really great quote, replace the need for things with the need of new human relationships. She also hints about what she spoke about in her full episode about changing the indices which we are measuring for success. The guests again, we've got Mark Thomas from episode 187, Sabrina Chikori from episode 179, Michael Holmstrom from episode 201, Imogen Schifferly from episode 189, and Deke Copenhaver from episode 186. We'll be back in your podcatchers again tomorrow with another bonus episode. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns, and smart cities. It's where we live, work, and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking looking for where to next for smart communities the covid chance is next and look there's been you know a lot of course of talk or in the media certainly in the us i'm not sure if the governor of new york's comments about is this the end of cities kind of had much uh, uptake in australia but because inevitably cities have been where covid has had its most negative impacts not just because that's where the people are but because just of density right I mean, the governor of New York who said, well, look, we've done density really badly. And he's saying maybe we shouldn't do density better. Maybe we should just not do it so much and encourage people to kind of live in the suburbs and things. 
So I think that's a, I think a relatively, uh, I was going to say uninformed, that's a bit unfair. That's an, maybe an obvious reaction. There's a big challenge if we want people to move to suburbs, right? Because that's ultimately not good for that famous kind of agglomeration idea of, of people need to be able to kind of work together and, and be together to kind of create economic value and wealth and, and creativity and diversity. But I think what the big opportunity is, though, is to think, well, we know there's big problems with density. I mean, partly that's actually where the smart communities idea uh, developed, you know, sort of 20 odd years ago about thinking ways that we can get technology to help us solve these city problems more effectively. What the COVID chance, I think, gives us the opportunity to do is to think, well, well, we know now that people can work from home and be productive. You know, huge economies around the world have, have been doing that. And of course, unfortunately, some still are. Sadly, in Melbourne, they're, of course, back in that situation for the moment now. So given that was something we thought would be difficult, expensive, ineffective, what's the COVID chance now where technology can come into play? Because, I mean, those countries and cities that have been able to do that, sure, it's been a bit tricky and a bit ropey with the internet connection. People have had to have devices. I'm not saying it's been a, a walk in the park, but the COVID chance now is to think about changing how we work with that and then rethinking the cities to think, okay, well, if we are going to need less of these buildings for office workers, what can we use it for? I, I chair um, a night shelter trust uh, in Auckland. We don't have night shelters uh, as part of the continuum for solving the homeless problem. Partly that's because it's hard to get you know, uh, properties in central cities. It's expensive. You've got higher paying tenants all the time. But what COVID gives us the opportunity to do is to sort of release these sorts of assets to solve other problems, right? And, and homeless is a real problem in most cities. So that's a big opportunity that I think COVID gives us too. It's, the heart of it is, is using technology to allow people to do their work in a different place. But the consequence of that is another smart idea, <laughs> um, not having people sleeping on our streets because we can put them somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I have hang out with a lot of planners and the makeup of cities and the way that we're organized. It's like this hub approach makes better use of resources, all these things that brings people together, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see because we don't want to just yeah, encourage urban sprawl either right and and you know it creates so many challenges with transport with health well, services well, everything i mean wouldn't it be dreadful if suburban sprawl was a was a consequence of covid i mean I, so the other sort of where to next is in terms of energy again if we are not needing energy used or the amount of it used in the same way what are the opportunities there for this distributed energy idea this, that i mentioned from southern malaysia this idea of of thinking about energy being reticulated in different ways. It's a little bit trickier, a little bit more complicated, but that's another kind of where-to opportunity, I think, from COVID. So I, look, I, I think that there's, most of us have climate change as, as a big priority. Interestingly, the survey that this committee for Auckland I mentioned that we did actually had the economy and poverty as the two priority um, issues that leaders in Auckland thought should be right at the top of the COVID response. They actually... You know, transport and climate change have been the big two in this region for a long time. So they actually dropped those back and said, you know, over the next year, it's the economic opportunities and, and things that we can do to help poverty. So, so I think the where to priorities um, for sort of smart thinking in this part of the world anyway needs to be focused on, on that. And, you know, economy is sometimes a bit of a poor cousin in the smart community space. We don't sort of think about it. We don't think about, uh, I always encourage, you know, people doing business cases to think more about the economic benefits and the economic development opportunities that can come from some, some smart community thinking. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I hope that like the transport and climate change don't fall off the list altogether because, you know, it's still really big issues, right? And It's essential that they don't. But if we think about one of these COVID chances, mainstreaming working from home, I mean, what, what a way to deal with transport congestions and with emissions by having 50% doesn't even have to be that much. You know, 50% of office workers, if they could work from home a couple of days a week, in all of our cities uh, where congestion is a problem, what a way to actually materially impact climate change. Because in most cities, you know, transport is the plurality of, of emissions being caused. You can be dealing with this idea of mainstreaming working from home, but have a phenomenal climate change a benefit actually at no cost to the city, other than maybe a, a bit of, I don't know, marketing cost if the city wants to pick up this idea that they're going to lead, you know, be the leader, be the role model and say, okay, businesses, don't jump back to business as usual. 
just when you come out of lockdown, but find a new way of operating and actually, as a consequence, help us with our climate change goals mm. and minimise congestion. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and, and that really reminds me that, like, you know, this isn't one thing. You don't, like, look at economy on its own or you don't look at climate change on its own. It affects so many different things, and I think that's where the smart community approach comes in, where it's just like, well, actually, we don't, we might have one focus, but actually it's a multiplier effect so then we can actually continue to impact these things. But I do think it's important that we focus and continue to talk about the different impacts that things are having, both positive and negative, so that we can actually get the full picture. Because I think a lot of time we only focus in on one or two, you know, one thing or whatever, and then we don't end up with the full picture. No, that's right. Where to next for smart communities? I think that actually it's really... It would be really interesting to see how, you know, your network would mobilize with the work they do, et cetera, during this time, because this is a very crucial moment. You know, we hear a lot about, again, about technology and technology used to implement safety measures around, you know, this COVID-19 situation. But we hear too little about redesigning community. So I really hope that Australia which is, you know, uh, our cities here, I mean, Brisbane, they're being developed, but I don't see that community, that the, actually the cities designed around community well-being. And there are cities such as, you know, Barcelona or other cities in the world that actually, they are actually designed around communities. Probably the fact that we also work more from home now and that this going to probably stay, going to push us to really reconnect more with people around us because we won't have you know that necessity of crossing the entire city just for a meeting or two so um, i think that we really need to replace first of all the need of things with the need of new human relationships and at a you know meso level smart communities really need to like cities and you know need to be designed around communities around community need and not around individual needs. And finally, you know, a macro level, as I said, we can't do all of this if we are measuring it with the wrong index. Where to next for smart communities? Ah, you mean smart communities in general? Yes. Well, what I'm hoping, and I'm hoping COVID-19 has done this. If anything good coming out of this, there's always something good coming out of the bad. That's what I've learned over the years. And I'm hoping that... We're now looking at how we live and how we commute, for example, into offices and, you know, solving traffic problems might not be the way to just build more roads. There might be better ways of, of doing that. So I guess there's so much you can say around that question you just asked. But I think in general, I'm hoping that society as a whole have had time now to take a time out and don't go back to what we always have done before. There are some tremendous lessons learned from what happened during COVID-19. A lot of bad stuff, Yes but also a lot of examples where technology like video conference has been around for yonkers. It's worked fine for at least about five years. And we never used it because it wasn't a way of communicating. I think now it's easy to say that Zoom is a great example of how we can actually communicate all across the world quite efficiently. Now, as you said before, I think it also brought up a feeling and a need that the human connection is more important than ever before. But I'm hoping that when we do get the chance to connect face-to-face, we make the most out of those opportunities. And we still solve things like transportation issues, communication issues, overpopulation by not just flocking to the cities. So without getting too deep in the answer here, I think I'm hoping that the future for smart communities and smart cities is that we take a really hard think about the pathway we were on before COVID-19 and what COVID-19 has actually learned, what we learned from that experience. And I think smart city, once again, to me, means that building a happy place and making happy place for people to live and to prosper. That's what this is all about. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if eight-way highways and is eight-lane highways is the solution to that. I think that is just, you know, it's just building a, a card house. Something like that. I don't think that's the solution at all. I think there's smarter ways of doing this. Because you're talking about smart cities and smart communities, right? What is smart then? I think there's really critical thinking about what do we want as human beings? What do we want? And I don't think that's more highways and more concrete. I think it's more about livable spaces to make people truly happy. Where to next for smart communities? 
Oh, gosh, you know, I mean, I did say earlier, what an agile state. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I, I couldn't even fathom that I would be, you know, sitting here the end of August and seeing the absolute transformation I have, even if I look internally, just, just our ability to adapt so quickly in an environment where we thought, you know, previously, tread gently, particularly in local government, as soon as you put any sort of transformation in the piece, productivity declines. And that's something that we can't, you know, we can't allow. All of those mindsets, I think, have gone out the window. And I think, you know, we're going to emerge into a situation for an expectation on non-traditional policies, procedures, and standards. I think we're going to see things that are, 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 you know, greener cities, but I actually mean physically greener cities. There's going to be technologies in there that are going to need to be more reactive, um, sorry, more adaptive and less reactive. We've got a lot of reactivity at the moment. And I see when I talk about adaptive, I mean something like if I were to go right into say, well, I would always say 10 years from now, but who knows at the rate of change at the moment, could be three years from now. For example, I've been thinking about networked cars. You know, how do we time things on a network so we can, going back to the point I made earlier around understanding our individual footprint, we can actually know based on a network of vehicles moving around a city the exact emissions at that hour in the day. And these will be more adaptive technologies to new lifestyles rather than, you know, a sensor indicator that might pick up movement. And that movement we know is going to be consistent throughout the day. Still quite sabbatical at the moment. But maybe it's heading more towards an environment where our cities don't need to be this hub of activity and our, you know, our urban cities. Similarly, what does it look like when we're sort of more addressing it as a, a point of purpose, a destination with adaptive technologies that actually allow people to remain out of the cities unless required and use these, you know, these traditional ideals? I think they're going to be moved right away and we're going to actually start going, well, I think it might be a focus on less purposeless movement, what are timed interchanges look like, timed activities, things that we can actually, as we all know now, we have the capability to be more productive with a greater life balance. How do we take that from a microchasm, as in our home, to this macro city land? And I actually think that's where we're going to be heading. Let's go back to enriching life, making life better, making life more adaptive and intuitive and less routine, regimented, monitored. I just see this now, whereas prior I would have said we're heading more and more down automation. And I, I, I think automation probably is going to exist, but in a completely different way. Mm, so interesting. And I think like, there's lots of discussion around this at the moment, particularly with, you know, the move away, you know, with COVID of CBDs and what the future of CBDs will be and, and all that type of stuff. So I think it's really interesting to bring in different viewpoints to the discussion. Um, but also going just to the foundation of what you said there is it's about buying back that leisure time, right? So using technology to not necessarily be more and more productive so then I can now get more and more done throughout the day, but actually I could use that time to spend, you know, with my family or walking or whatever, whatever you want to be doing. But the expectation is not there that you are 100% productive all the time, which we know is unsustainable. We know that it causes all these health issues. We know all these things, but we continue to, I guess, try and move into this or we wear the busyness as a badge of honour, et cetera, et cetera. I'm getting a bit too philosophical uh, right now. No, but- <laughs> let's keep going. I love, I love where you're going with it though because that's exactly it. And the, the phrase you just used, you know, buying back leisure. The fact that it was such a commodity we had to exchange yes. in the first instance. And, and no wonder, you know, generationally, we've seen this play out. And we are now in, in this generation of sort of going, oh, wait a minute, you know, wait, let's just, let's put pause on, let's put pause on this, which is kind of what COVID's done for us. And now we're not only looking at sustainable environmental practices, but sustainable humanitarian practices for everybody 
not just those in a critical environment, critical needs, everyone is critical to this earth. And that's what we need to focus on. Mm, yeah, no, I totally agree. And But I think with the smart community thing, I talk a lot about it not being about technology. It's because it's actually like to have that shift, you don't need more smart technology. If we haven't instilled a mindset that we can buy back leisure time and not feel guilty about it or whatever, then, you know, it's never going to work no matter how much smart technology you throw at it. So I think, yeah, it's going to be really, really interesting. So yeah, thanks for taking us down that road. Where to next for smart communities? Uh, (laughs) It's interesting. I think this is going to push for communities to be smarter because they have to. And we've hit a situation where, here again, your message is to me more poignant in Australia and every place now. We have got to push the message of smart communities now more than ever. And here again, I just go back to that interconnection and that connection of resources. It has become... and. I like the idea of community because community means we're all in it together. And hopefully this has really set a tone where we've realized that we're all connected, every community, every citizen of the world through our humanity, because in some way this is basically impacting the lives of everybody on the planet. So I'm hoping that, it helps raise the platform for smart communities. And I think I know one of the people that I think will be one of the leading voices on that. And that would be my friend Zoe. Well, thank you. That wasn't even stage. I I really appreciate it. And it's something, yes, it's, um, it has to be. And written some pieces and I've been doing some virtual keynotes as well. And it's our new reality is smart communities. And, and I guess it's not the, it's not the, brand it's not the buzz it's not that it's the, no. the un and, and we, i know i'm preaching to the choir here it's it's the underlying fundamentals that are required to actually be able to continue into the future and you know really embrace that i'm just using a few too many buzzwords at the moment but just equality and the inclusiveness yes. and yes and the diverseness of our communities it's it's something that is fundamental. And I think that digital layer has to be there, but it's not yes. the driver, right? It's the, it's the enabler. But if we don't focus in on the pain points that we're trying to solve, these complex issues, bringing the community in and you know, having these discussions like um, you were talking about with your earlier project, then it won't change and we won't increase the trust um, with leadership. We won't be able to do the things that we want to do and we won't you know, have a, a future that, like that we've shaped and that we really fit in with. And I think that's the something I've been thinking about a lot during this time, that what digital has enabled us to be able to do, but also that it doesn't have to be all or the other, that, you know, we've decreased the physical connection, which has enhanced the digital and human connection, um, but and we can survive during this time mostly. And again, only speaking from, yeah, I guess my experience and the people I've spoken with, but some people are, uh, are just barely surviving. And But for smart communities, it has to be thriving. So we have to be able to embrace all levels of connection. And, yeah, that's something I've been thinking about and, and well, working well, on a lot. Zoe, I will, uh, you know, we sort of opened the show talking about your visit here to Augusta, but I will share with you one of my fondest memories of this year was For your listeners, I was going to take you to show you our new mixed-use baseball stadium here. But instead, we've got the canal trails along the Augusta Canal and the Savannah River. And we just went for a walk. And that green space was permanently protected by the Land Trust when I was executive director of the Land Trust. But it is that human connection. And that walk along that beautiful trail and that riverfront And just our conversation, that was something that is dear to me. And just in that environment and just that human connection. So I just, I applaud what you do. I applaud your passion. And I'm just, I'm very, I consider myself very blessed that we've connected. Thank you so much, Deke. And I agree. I think that was, yeah, definitely a highlight for me as well and and how we can yeah, go back to basics a little bit, but realize that it's 
these underlying enablers and, and the passion of people doing these things that really create that. It doesn't just happen by accident. No, and, and, and I'll tell you, that's what I think part of the reason why I'm so passionate about you know, Spark communities and everything. So, so it costs nobody any money to access that trail. Mm-hmm. That trail is open to everybody, and it's used by people from all walks of life. And particularly after the pandemic hit, I would go down there and run every day and it was a melting pot for the community and more people I saw using those trails to get outside, to get fresh air, to get some exercise. And I thought this piece of green infrastructure has meant so much to so many people during this period of time, you know, so I, it's builds a stronger community and it connects everybody together. The Smart Community Podcast is brought to you by My Smart Community. If you're looking for support in podcast strategy and production, workshop design and facilitation, or communication and media advisory, get in touch. Email hello at mysmart.community or head to www.mysmart.community. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at smartcomhq. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes. So thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Community podcast is what you're looking for.